The true crime podcast you are listening to is based in fact. Join host Lisa O'Brien as she examines America's most infamous true crime cases through the lens of the court, not the court of public opinion. No rumor, no spin, no theories, just that. Here's Lisa O'Brien. In episode 20, Kyle and I will conclude our discussion of State of Texas versus Henry Watkins Skinner. Skinner was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to death in 1995 for the New Year's Eve 1993 murders of his girlfriend, Twyla Busby, and her sons, Randy Busby and Elwin Kaler in Pampa, Texas. Skinner, who was the only member of the household to walk away that New Year's morning, initially admitted that he fought with Twyla, but tried to blame her for the deaths of her sons. Early DNA testing linked Twyla and Elwin to the blood-soaked clothing Skinner was wearing when he was arrested, and testing done by the DA in 2000 further linked Skinner to the murders. In 2001, Skinner began pursuing DNA testing in the Texas courts. In part two, we'll recap the evidence against Skinner, his direct appeal and post-conviction claims in state and federal court, and wrap up our look at the case with a discussion of the DNA testing proceedings, agreed DNA testing conducted in 2012, and the court's resolution of Skinner's actual innocence claims based on those results. And it is, today is December 29th, 2022, so Kyle and I are recording on an extra day and uh he's having some issues kyle you there i am oh good afternoon and a uh, happy uh early early new happy year. new year yeah, late, early late happy merry new christmas year. yeah late merry christmas hope you had a good one i'm yes. uh the boss and I are recovering over a little bit of uh, the crud, but I'm starting to feel human. So oh, looking gosh. forward to this. Yes. All right. Well, uh, let's go ahead and get the recap started. We're just going to kind of go through basic uh, procedural history for the case. Of course, our victims in the case are Twyla Busby, who was 39 years old. Uh, her sons, Elwin Scooter Kaler, who was 22, I believe, and her, uh, or no, he, yeah, he was 22, and her youngest was Melvin Randolph Busby, who was 19. He would have turned 20 on January 31st of 19, or no, he just turned 20 in January, so he would have turned 21 in 1994. Uh, the perpetrator is Hank Henry Watkins, Hank Skinner. Uh, he is a manipulator. He's a sociopath. He's a smooth talker. And he has alcohol and drug problems. Um, he has a lot of prior arrests, but his only convictions were aggravated assault of a peace officer and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. Although he did have some pending charges for, I think, injury to a child and aggravated assault, I believe on Twyla, uh, that he hadn't been tried for at the time uh, of his arrest for these murders. Yeah, so and, he sounds like an all-around good guy. Oh, yeah. So, um, and, you know, he moved in with Twyla and her sons in a little house in Pampa, Texas, uh, during the summer of 1993. Uh, they lived there. They were both heavy drinkers. They both used drugs. And um, while Skinner denies it, um, he has been accused by men many people of having abused Twyla. But Twyla loved him so much she wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't leave him. She wouldn't throw him out. Um, New Year's Eve, he and Twyla were had spent the day partying. They were both really drunk at around 9 p.m., Skinner called Howard Mitchell and asked for a ride to a New Year's Eve party. Uh, either Mitchell or his daughter were hosting that night. Uh, when Mitchell arrived about 45 minutes later, Skinner was passed out on the couch and couldn't be roused. Twyla 
left the, for the party with Mitchell carrying Skinner's bottle of vodka, which was probably her first mistake or her second mistake leaving was her first. And while she expressed concern that Skinner would be angry if he woke up while she was gone, um, she went anyway. Once at the party, her uncle, Robert Bob Donnell, who also lived in Pampa, uh, allegedly followed her around making inappropriate sexual advances towards her. Uh, Mitchell, however, described Twyla's reaction to these advances by Donnell more as annoyance or aggravation than fearful. Uh, once yeah, she'd had that's enough, probably something she's been living with for probably for a long it. lot of her and life. So she's probably there are there it. are are some statements from some people developed during Skinner's post conviction where people actually said that Twyla had told them she was in a consensual relationship with Donald. Although I don't necessarily believe that to be true. Um, and given that Skinner is so jealous, how could she be involved in a consensual relationship with, with Donald without Skinner being, you know, having problems with Skinner? So exactly. I, I don't know that that's, but I think that was all thrown into the pot to see what sticks. Right. Just to muddy the Skinner. water. Um, yeah. Around 11, uh, well, she was at the party she had enough of donald's behavior uh and perhaps because she was concerned skinner would wake while she was gone twyla asked mitchell to bring her home and they arrived there about 11 15 11 o'clock to 11 15 twyla uh was last seen alive when mitchell watched her enter the house that she scared shared with skinner elwin randy and her daughter lisa who was staying with her grandmother that night because she was concerned about Skinner's heavy drinking. You know, I all, I mean, I always feel sorry for all of these victims and just what they have to put up in, you know, within their lives. But I don't know, it just sort of resonates me that of all of this poor lady's problems, having an uncle that is sexually harassing you to the point you have to leave a party. I just, I feel for people, I know they're out there that have to live with these types of things, yeah. but it just, it's, it's and tragic. And again, the the inference that I've drawn from Mitchell's testimony and statements about it is that Twyla wasn't afraid and she wasn't necessarily concerned about Donald or what he might do. Again, I think she was just annoyed and tired of it. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's like the old, you know, the stereotypical probably... 80s office sexual harassment you know okay i'm not scared of you but i'm still really sick of it i'd like to enjoy the party with my uncle mm -hmm. of all people bothering yeah me. yeah uh so about 45 minutes after mitchell dropped twyla off officer fred courtney of the panther police department was dispatched to investigate a stabbing he found Elwin on a neighbor's porch, bleeding profusely from a stab wound under his left arm that had punctured his lung. Uh, Elwin died at the hospital at 12.45 a.m. on January 1st, 1994. Pampa police officers followed a blood trail back to Twyla's house. And when you see where their house was and where this place was where Elwin went, it's actually some distance. It's not like he went out and went right next door. Uh, the the house he went to was a little bit down the block and kind of across the street. But it looks like they they lived next to empty lots. So. Um, yeah, that's that's common. And I'm reasonably familiar with Pampa, so that is not surprising mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Um, Pampa. Uh, so they. When they followed the blood trail back to Twyla's house, they found Twyla's body on the living room floor next to a bloody axe handle. An autopsy would later reveal that she'd been strangled and beaten to death. Randy was found dead in the top bunk in the boy's bedroom. He'd been stabbed three times in the back. Officers did not find Skinner unconscious or passed out on the couch in the house when they made entry. Um, because after killing Twyla and Randy and mortally wounding Elwin, 
Skinner in bloody clothing made his way out the back door of the house into the trailer of an old girlfriend, Andrea Reed. When Andrea's daughter opened the door, Skinner barged into the trailer claiming he'd been stabbed and shot. Reed was unable to find any wounds except for a deep cut in Skinner's right hand. While at Reed's trailer, Skinner removed his shirt, burned needles to sterilize them, and bent them to use to stitch up his hand. He asked Reed to stitch the wound when he realized he couldn't do it himself. When Skinner caught Reed trying to call police, he threatened to kill her and her children. And that was the question I was going to ask, just to clarify. At no point has he ever attempted to call the police. No, he did not call. And not the only did he not call, he stopped his ex-girlfriend from calling. He kept he kept Andrea from calling. She said she wanted to call Twyla. And at that point, he said, I think I, I kicked Twyla to death. And I know, um, so, you know, we'll get to it later, but as I always like to imply Occam's razor, this is not the way innocent people behave. Mm -hmm. Correct. I mean, if he really did wake up on the on the couch covered in blood with Twyla's dead body on the floor. And I th I think in his some of his statements, he's claimed to have witnessed Elwin leaving the house. Why would he not call police? Right, because all if of these he had cases, nothing to do with it. Yeah, all of these things, even the ones that cite, oh, DNA, oh, I'm innocent. They always have very similar things in common, which is they just don't call the police. And they act in ways that are really counterintuitive and their mm -hmm. stories constantly change, which have nothing to do with the DNA. Mm -hmm. This is not the way an innocent person acts. Correct. Uh, over the course of the next three hours, Skinner made conflicting statements about what had happened to Reed. In response to Reed expressing a desire to call Twyla, Skinner told her he ca caught Twyla in bed with her ex-husband and beaten the man before throwing him out of the house. After swearing Reed to secrecy, Skinner told her that he may have kicked so, Twyla to death. Can, can I ask you just a clarifying question? Is there any, his, is the ex-husband even in Pampa? Was he at the part, like with he, is that even reasonable or that, does the guy live three hours away? That is time? something I do not know. That This is a 1993 case and right. most of the internet activity related to the case is focused on Skinner. Um, but he, he identified to police, he gave a name of another guy that he allegedly caught Twyla. So catching well, Twyla in bed with some other man is just, I, I think Skinner's just Skinner's attempt to make it seem like he, his actions were justified or his anger at Twyla was justified. Got it. So it was the ex-husband then it was another man. And then maybe later on, it could have been the uncle. Well, that's another thing, changing. too. Interestingly enough, in all of his statements that I've seen or read, he has never claimed to have seen Robert Donnell in the house that night. He has never claimed to have seen any other assailant in the house that night. So it just keeps changing. Yeah. And Grant, and you know, Skinner, according to the testimony of the sheriff of the uh, of uh, Gray County at the time of the murders, Randy Stubblefield, or, I, or his last name was Stubblefield. I don't know if his first name is Randy or not. Um, Skinner was the type of person he would put his fist through a window right in front of a cop and then claim he didn't do it. That it was like that when he got there. Right. You know, I mean, he was. Uh, he was witnessed by a police officer destroying property and claimed he didn't do it. Um, and there, and you know, then there are other instances where like the, the, the uh, assault on the police officer charge. Well, he didn't really do anything. The cop was assaulting him and he was just defending himself. So that's, that's who we're dealing with. Yeah. Nothing's ever his fault. So uh, at around 3 a.m., police tracked Skinner down to Reed's trailer. When they entered the trailer, they found Skinner hiding behind clothes in Reed's closet. Skinner had an outstanding warrant for injury to a child and aggravated assault. And when he was being arrested on those warrants, he said to officers, is that all? So, you know, not, not what happened. I don't know what's going on. What happened to Twyla? What happened to the boys? Nope. You're arresting me on these warrants. Is that all you got? 
And I think he likes the challenge and he likes to play games because he does that when he's incarcerated. You know, because he calls himself a paralegal. And so he, you know, he files claims and he files administrative actions and he, and he files uh, uh, injunctions to try and keep like his mail from being opened. Yeah, it's funny. I was watching a few YouTube interviews with him and I was surprised. I think it was um, Werner Herzog actually pointed out he was making something about not being properly representative and Herzog's credit at least said, weren't, didn't you claim to be a paralegal? Shouldn't you understand, you know, at least more than the average person about, you know, proper representation? And he kind of muffled about some conspiracy with the judge. Uh huh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's another thing, too, with Skinner is he cannot get the story straight. And when you ask him for clarification, he goes off on a tangent. Yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, and that's the theme, you know, I always see these patterns and themes across all of these cases, and that's always one of them. It's just the ever changing story and a mass conspiracy, or you're the unluckiest person in the world that all this evidence points mm -hmm. to you. Correct. So, um, so Skinner's trial was held uh, from March 7th, 1995 to March 23rd, 1995. The state had DNA evidence. They didn't test everything because in 1995, uh, testing was somewhat primitive. You needed the quantity of material necessary was often prohibitive. The cost was often prohibitive. So in this case, they chose to test Skinner's clothing and, and various blood spots on Skinner's clothing to try and determine whether it was all his or whether it belonged to him and the victims, uh, which they found Twyla and Elwin's blood or DNA profiles consistent with Twyla and Elwin on Skinner's pants. Uh, the shirt, I believe, was all Skinner's. And however, even at trial, in 1995, the analysts testified that only one in 5.5 billion people would have the same DNA profiles as the ones extracted from the blood on the shirt and pants, including Skinner. And there were some mixtures, I think, of Twyla, Elwin, and Skinner in those profiles. Fingerprint evidence also showed that bloody handprints found on the doorframe and doorstop molding in Randy and Elwin's room where Randy's body was found were consistent with Skinner's prints, as were bloody fingerprints found on the knobs of the door leading from the kitchen to the utility room. And the backyard was also, uh, a door leading to the backyard was also identified as a, a print on a door was also identified as Skinner's. Uh, Skinner was convicted of capital murder on March 18th, 1995, and his jury sentenced him to death on March 23rd, 1995. And that sentence was formally ordered by the court on April 20th, 1995. So just to restate the obvious, so the victim's blood is on his clothes mm -hmm. and his prints are found in their blood all over the house. No, the well, blood, all, but... the blood where the prints were found was not tested at the time. But it, but it, but sorry, okay, fair enough. I, that's right. I was making that assumption it was there, but, but his prints were found going to one of the victim's room into the back, Correct. leaving the home. So his prints Correct. were found in multiple places in blood around the house. Correct. And, um, uh, yeah, so that was, um, that was the state of DNA. So his conviction from the beginning has been supported by inculpatory DNA evidence because victim's blood on your pants and it was front and back of the pants there's no exculpatory explanation for that finding uh, because if he, if he was allegedly passed out on the couch exactly. then how would, any, how would anything have gotten on the back of his clothing exactly 
Yeah, it's sort of, it's kind of reminds me of the Darley Routier with the yeah. blood on the back of her shirt when it's like, okay, how would that blood have gotten on the back of your shirt if you were asleep on the couch during the attack? Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that's, that's important, I think, to point out too with that is that while there was a blood spatter report generated during the original homicide investigation, it was somewhat rudimentary. It was based on an examination of photographs. And it was limited to uh, photographs of Twyla, photographs of Elwyn, and photographs of some of the blood patterns that were observed by investigators. Um, it was not like a comprehensive analysis done by someone like Ron Eglert Rod Englert in um, or one of the other blood spatter type experts that is available out there. Um, and so it provided some ambiguous results that have been turned around and tried, Skinner's tried to use them as exculpatory. Uh, for example, he argues that a, a pattern observed on L1 even though there's no determination of who the blood belongs to, the pattern suggests that Elwin was in the room while Twyla was being beaten. So then the argument becomes, well, he couldn't have dealt with Twyla and Elwin at the same time because he was so incapacitated by over, you know, codeine and he's got this allergy. And uh, in reality, what the blood, it, it doesn't say he had to deal with two conscious victims he could have dealt with that one after rendering twyla unconscious twyla could have been unconscious the whole time elwin was there so he could have stopped whatever he was doing to twyla and stabbed elwin and he was done now personally and this is my speculation i think what happened was he fought with twyla about leaving with his vodka it got heated it got out of hand then he ended up beating her to death and when he realized she was dead and Elwin had come out probably because of the commotion, he had to do something. So he grabbed a knife, he stabbed and killed Elwin, and then he had to go kill Randy as well, even though Randy was asleep and there's no signs that Randy ever, ever even rose or woke up. Yeah, that makes um, sense. Um, and that makes sense with the, uh, you know, and the blood on the back could have been from him falling into blood. Uh, it could have been during struggle with the victims, you know, uh, a lot of different scenarios would support that. And there's never been a comprehensive analysis of the blood spatter by an expert of all the blood spatter, not just the limited ones that were looked at in 1994. So although Skinner will pretend that that is what he's got. On direct appeal, uh, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed his conviction for capital murder and death sentence, uh, finding that while the trial court had erred in admitting certain work product documents, the error was harmless beyond a reasonable doubt. And that was uh, documents uh, used to cross-examine, created by one of his experts used to cross-examine that expert. Um, it, been, it was basically pointing out flaws in the case but the court found that a harmless error because the flaws in that document had been brought in through other sources. Or the flaws being identified by the expert initially had been brought in through other sources. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court denied Skinner's writ uh, and his conviction and sentence became final on April 20th, 1998. Then Skinner moves to state post-conviction, and we talked about this a little bit um, in more depth last time. Uh, basically, his um, first post-conviction writ was dismissed as untimely because his attorney, who had been representing him since his direct appeal, filed a motion for extension of time to file the writ at the Court of Criminal Appeals when it should have been filed at the trial court because that's where the writ was due. 
uh, the the Court of Criminal Appeals denied the motion for extension of time without prejudice to go to the trial court. The trial court took no action on Skinner's motion, which was filed, I believe, the day after the writ was due. Because it was due on January 21st, 1998. And in his uh, presentations, Skinner failed to show good cause for the late filing under Article 11.071. Um, good cause would have been the attorney representing him had died. And so somebody else was having to get up to speed in order to in order to file the writ. Uh, that didn't happen because the attorney who was filing the writ and seeking more time was the same attorney who had been representing him since July time. of 1997. Um, so the writ was dismissed as untimely on uh, January 27, 1999. He went to federal court for federal habeas uh, because you have certain time after your state post-conviction, conclusion of state post-conviction to get to federal court. The magistrate judge, however, in federal court recommended that he be allowed to return to the state court for purposes of complying with the statute. Because a new statute had been enacted giving people who had filed untimely writs a chance to go come back and, and file their writ and have their writ heard. Um, and so the federal court set a 30-day uh, deadline for Skinner to file an initial pleading, which could have been an a request to have an attorney appointed in state court um, to uh, get his writ in state court filed. Uh, the judge entered an order granting uh, granting the request for clarification of what initial pleading meant uh, filed by Skinner. And then on 8-1-2000, the court adopted the report and recommendation and granted the uh, Skinner's motion to abate and denied the state's motion to dismiss for failure to exhaust state remedies. Because he hasn't had any state claims or any claims heard by the state trial, by the state court. And in federal court, the state court has to get the first bite of the apple. Right. And is that all back to the late filing or other reasons why he's the late filing is the reason the state writ was not heard. Got it. Okay. So it all does um, go back to that. Because you you have you have a certain time, I think it's 180 days after an attorney's appointed. So he had an attorney appointed in July of 1997, making his writ due in January of 1998. And he didn't show good cause. The attorney didn't show good cause for why, first, why he needed the extra time, and B, why he um, couldn't timely file the couldn't writ. Do it. Right. And I think why he went to the wrong court for a, for a, uh, and, and you know, if he had, when he went to the TCCA, he could have filed the writ in the state court on the day that they denied his his request he could have filed a writ and then supplemented it later and that's one of the reasons he failed to show good cause even if you didn't have all the facts you needed you could have filed a writ and then in the time you were seeking which was till like march or uh i think march of 1998 he could have filed a supplemental writ in March of 1998 after he developed all the facts he wanted to develop. Um, but he didn't right. do that. So, And as a reminder, um, this is a guy who pretends to be a paralegal, so should know more than the average right. citizen. Right. And this uh, also, this is not the attorney that represented him at trial. He was appointed a new attorney for the direct appeal. And after the direct appeal, this new attorney was appointed to represent him on post-conviction. So 
um, Skinner filed a, a second state post-conviction writ, but on October 10th, 2001, that writ was dismissed due to the pending ha federal habeas corpus peti petition. And basically there was kind of a catch 22 for Skinner and the courts. If the federal court dismissed the first federal writ, there was, would have been an argument down the road that the, whenever he refiled the federal writ of habeas corpus, it would not be timely. Because it runs from when your conviction and sentence become final. And not not you know definitely from the end of your state post if you file state post conviction your writ filed after that concludes is timely but if you gotcha. file it untimely at the wrong time it's like you never filed it at all and when it's dismissed it's like you never filed it at all so and i think that i'm probably sense. confusing people more than i'm explaining <laughs> but um, so the court, the, the magistrate file uh, basically chose the option that he believed to, would protect Skinner's rights down the road, and that was to not dismiss, but to abate, to stay in abate. However, in Texas, they have a federal uh, habeas corpus abstention doctrine, which means if you're in federal court filing habeas corpus or you have a habeas corpus claim pending before federal court you cannot come back to state court and file a state writ because you can't have your claims considered on two competing forums at the same time got it so once you decide to go to federal you're you've effectively exhausted any it, state remedies well EDPA kind of makes it very difficult uh, because EDPA has additional restrictions. For example, if you don't pursue state post-conviction um, at all, then you're stuck with whatever the record was on, a, on direct appeal and at trial. Whereas state post-conviction is, is generally the avenue that you use to develop the state court record as to trial, as to direct appeal, and as to whatever claims of federal or state constitutional violations that you believe occurred during your trial or your direct appeals. So um, if you, like in this case, he did file, but it was untimely. And when he had the opportunity to go back, the federal court was trying to protect his federal habeas rights by not dismissing. And, but when he went back to state court, because it wasn't dismissed and it was, even though it was stayed and abated, it was still there. And so the state court wasn't going to consider his second state post-conviction writ. Gotcha. So then he went back and reopened uh, the federal habeas claim. And this is an instance where the federal court did, any criticisms are totally unwarranted. The federal court did bend over backwards to protect Skinner's rights. And I'll explain that a little bit further. Uh, first of all, the magistrate recommended that the state's motion to dismiss for failure to exhaust state remedies be denied. The state's thought was that if the federal court dismissed, Skinner could file another state post-conviction writ and the state would hear it. And then he could come back to federal court. But again, the, the federal court was worried that that dismissal would impact statute of limitations under federal habeas law 
And so they uh, elected to overrule um, the state's objections to the failure to dismiss and the order, the report and recommendation were adopted and the motion to dismiss was denied without prejudice uh, as set forth in the report and recommendation. Then in protecting Skinner's rights, the federal court allowed limited discovery at Skinner's request to develop evidence not developed in state court because the state claims were dismissed. Uh, Skinner also got an evidentiary hearing, which was held November 16th, 17th, and 18th of 2005. Um, and that's another thing, too. I mean, the process has not been a fast one. It's four years since his, uh, it's been four years since his, or three years since his uh, federal habeas was reopened, and they're just getting around to the hearing. And the the docket from the federal court is like 25 or 26 pages long. There was a lot of stuff going on. I mean, there was discovery. They de they deposed Stubblefield, uh, the sheriff. They got um, the gene screen information that they'd been seeking from the state for a couple of years to evaluate the gene screen DNA results, which were done in 2000. Um, and I'm going to talk about those a little bit later. Um, so then on February 22nd, 2000, the report and recommendation denying Skinner habeas relief was, uh, adopted by the federal judge and writ of, uh, habeas corpus was denied for Skinner on the 2nd of July, 2007, the magistrate's recommendation that Skinner be denied a certificate of appealability was also uh, adopted and Skinner's request for a certificate of appeal appealability was denied. The case went on to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeal, uh, which granted a, a certificate of appealability with regard to some of the claims Skinner was making, which were the claim that his counsel failed to use a blood spatter report and a claim of failure to discover and present witnesses testimony about Robert Donnell. Um, so they, they did limit, they did give him limited uh, certificate of appealability on those issues because it involved an allegation of ineffective assistance of counsel. Which as we've talked about before, just seems to be what is a part of every appeal, it seems like. Yes. And and a lot of that also involves second guessing. Um, right. I think the only case that I haven't, I've seen it thrown around as ineffective assistance, but I have not seen it actually pursued as Rodney Reed. Got it. And Richard Glossop. Well, it's like you said, sometimes it's just strategic, like the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the attorney might advise, you know, you shouldn't testify, right. and the defendant agrees, and then later on they say, oh, well, he wouldn't let me testify, so in effect, right, counsel. are they, and they claim he, they claim he threatened, right, you know, it's forced not actual him. malpractice, if you will, yeah, and I, I remember there was a case years ago, and uh, I can't remember where, what state or who it was, but um, the the defendant was in the post conviction hearing, and he was testifying how the attorney threatened him, and how when he had the colloquy with the judge in the courtroom, the judge was threatening him. So he just said what the judge wanted him to say. That was his testimony to the direct examination. Well, then the prosecutor on cross examination brought in those transcripts. And reads, you know, the judge's question because they, they have like a script and they ask you this question and you answer yes or no. Right. And they ask you the next one and they answer yes or no. And he's like, well, where did the judge threaten you? And it's like, well, it was his eyes. <laughs> you know, but you could see. And this is like on court TV or somewhere. Uh. I maybe even found it on YouTube somewhere. 
and you could see the guy was like struggling as as the the district attorney prosecutor is questioning him about this and then finally he's just like oh it was his eyes he's the way he was looking at me that's not gonna be on the record <laughs> <laughs> you know so it can't be it can't be refuted but it's kind of unlikely right and um so but you know he's like well did you ever tell anybody because a lot of times too is that gets people is they'll they'll make up something like this like well did you ever tell anybody did you tell your post-conviction attorneys that you were threatened by the judge and you were threatened? And, you know, defendants will say they were threatened before the court went on the record. Um, right. and Always something that's improvable, just like they can throw out the, yeah. you know, the one-armed man well, who did it, who no one I, ever saw, but, you know, I, without chasing them down. That I've actually, I've actually seen court reporters brought in to testify that when, when the judge came on the bench, I started taking testimony. I recorded everything and even producing, you know, the transcripts of the introductory because the judge will come on the bench and, and, you know, make an announcement of what he's right. there for or why he's there. And she's like, I record every minute of that. And there was no off the record, you know, right thing. So. All right. So then the Fifth Circuit uh, on July 14, 2009, uh, basically affirmed the district court judge court's judgment denying relief. They found that um, Skinner had failed to demonstrate that the omission of the blood spatter report was sufficiently prejudicial. Even taking the report at face value, it did not establish beyond mere speculation that the blood on the sun was the girlfriend's and further the evidence showed that the girlfriend would have been unconscious from strangulation and therefore the inmate would not have had two active victims in the same room further there was ample evidence that inmate was the murderer including his confession and the lack of physical evidence of any other perpetrator the court held that there was no reasonable probability that but for counsel's failure to use the blood spatter report the result of the proceeding would have been an acquittal. And so that was that. Uh, Skinner did take a writ to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was denied on March 1st, 2010. Um, and it was on November 27, 2009, that Skinner versus Switzer was filed because of the denial of DNA testing in state courts, which we will talk about a little bit more in later uh on january 20th 2010 skinner versus switzer was um was dismissed the fifth circuit affirmed and then the case went to the u.s supreme court and the u.s court of appeals uh the uh, supreme court ultimately in an opinion authored by late justice ginsburg uh, found in Skinner's favor and reversed the Fifth Circuit and remanded the case for further proceedings consistent with their opinion. It was a 6-3 decision, uh, and Justice Thomas, of course, authored a, a very interesting dissent. So now we're at part two, and we're going to talk about first the state DNA proceedings and we're going to kind of mix in some execution dates and, and some state subsequent state proceedings. So it's it was very difficult for me to do this outline because I wanted to keep it in some chronological order, but it was very difficult to do because the the, the remedies and the avenues being pursued were different. And, and kind of went into different categories. But since one of Skinner's main claims will be that the results of mtDNA testing are, mitochondrial DNA testing, uh, are exculpatory as to him, um, the first thing we have to do is I, I have to point out that the hairs that do not exclude Twyla also do not exclude her maternal relatives because 
mitochondrial DNA is passed unchanged through the female line. Um, y STR is passed unchanged through the male line because it's the Y chromosome. So um, while uh, the mi mitochondrial DNA results do not exclude her grandmother, her uncle Orville, who was deceased by 1991, but if he'd been in the house and had shed hair in the house, it would not exclude him. Her uncle, Robert Donnell, and her other uncle, Louis Frederick Bub Donnell. Um, then it would not have excluded her mother, Beverly Ann Donald Clark, Ward Clark, her siblings, Douglas Ray Ward, LaDonna K. Ward Alderson, or Bobby Jean Rusty Ward Jr. And it would not have excluded her children, Elwin, Randy, and Lisa. Um, Pre-trial, as we talked about earlier, uh, the state had collected various items from the scene, but only tested the clothing being worn by Skinner, more likely than not due to some of the limitations of the technology at that time, and basically found DNA profo profiles consistent with Twyla, Elwin, and Skinner, uh, and those profiles were basically one in 5.5 billion people would have the same DNA profiles as the one, ones extracted. And this is nuclear DNA. It's not mitochondrial. It's not uh, HLA-DQ alpha. As far as I can tell, it's nuclear DNA. Because HLA-DQ alpha, they can only say percentage-wise. Right. Um. Then in 2000, the DA, at urging from David Protest, who we know, uh, well, you may not know this because you weren't with me then, uh, who we know from Clear and Convincing, framed a gentleman by the name of Al Story Simon for a murder committed by his client, Anthony Porter. The Chicago case, right? The, the Chicago, Chicago case, yes. Heart killing. Yes. Uh, and uh, I would... I would recommend the documentary Murder in the Park. Yeah, it's a great one. It is awesome. And um, David Protest is one of the many fathers of the innocence fraud movement. And is he the is he the professor at Northwestern or was he one of the scientists? He was the professor at Northwestern. Okay. Um, he was a journal. And this is one of the things that I've always had a problem with. First of all, he was a journalism professor, not a law professor. Not a and law his professor clinics, or a scientist. Correct. And his clinics were not legal issues. His clinics were, quote, investigatory. And they would use tactics that they criticized the police for in order to challenge convictions right and so it's i think it's important to double click on that because i'm not sure a lot is you know this is one of those things that you know the bias by omission just doesn't get a lot of coverage but really the person you know largely behind the innocence fraud movement began by framing an innocent man as you correct. said doing exactly what they using, criticized correct. the police for using tactics they they lied to the guy they played a video <laughs> yeah. of a supposed witness fingering him for the murder um you know they told him that he was going to go he was going to go be executed exactly so it just shows if he didn't you confess the, yeah. the desire the kind of religious cultism just to get person a off they mm -hmm. would sacrifice person b it's insane yeah. yeah if you haven't watched the murder in the park i forget which streamer is on but i saw it last summer it was really good i think it was netflix that sounds right because it seems like i signed up for netflix to be able to watch that one it's a lot more interesting than um veruca salt and the spare air telling us about the problems of being former royals <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. 
I just, I cannot, I mean, you know, we ought to do a show talking about that. Cause I got a lot to say about that woman. <laughs> that would mean we'd have to watch it. I'm not sure. <laughs> that. No, because I can go, I can tell <laughs> you, well, okay. Short version, spoiler alert. When you marry into the Royal family, you are getting a shit show and your life no longer is your own. It belongs to the paparazzi. It belongs to the media and it belongs to the Royal family. And you just have to deal with that. And the problem with Megan is she's an American and she's dumb and she can't deal. Exactly. So then she wants to play the victim and be the victim because as an American, we're really good at that. Yeah, victimhood is the most powerful currency these days. Yeah, so that's that's my take on Megan. And um, you know, my when they claim that the 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 institution was racist, I'm like, girl, if they were racist, you would have never married him. Yeah, exactly. Because he could not marry without Queen Elizabeth's approval. Right. I mean, I realize it's been a hundred, well, what is a hundred and hundred years? But uh -huh. yeah, the last guy that tried this had to abdicate. So she already was getting very Correct. special treatment. Correct. Well, he had to abdicate because as the as the supreme head of the Church of England, he could not be married to a divorced woman with two husbands still alive. But she's still a divorcee too, right? Hasn't she? I think she's she is a divorcee before. and her husband's still alive. The only the only saving grace for Charles is that Diana's dead. Oh, no, I'm so, but no, Megan was previously married. Yes, right? Megan's previously yeah. married. So but she'd because, be the same thing as Harry. Because with, with... Harry, because Harry was not the presumptive. Oh, because he was like the yeah, third or fourth in line. That's fair. Correct. Gotcha. Now, had William never married and never had children, Harry would be second now. Right. But now that they've got the other but whatever, because they've got kids, children, he's but, fifth or sixth now. And, and a, a distinction people don't realize, um, their marriage took place, their marriage was approved prior to Prince Louis' birth, which means Harry could not marry without the Queen's permission. Yeah, he absolutely. would have lost royal yeah, titles. Of course. He would have lost his position. He would have lost everything if he married Meghan without her approval. Of course. Now, once Prince Louis was born, he could marry who he wants. Because once he goes down a certain, you know, to a certain point in the line of succession, then he has the freedom to marry whoever he wants. The, the act of parliament or Victoria's law regarding approval of the and i think that goes back to actually to george one of the georges um because all of his sons were with actresses and prostitutes and catholic women and so you know they had to make it so that they could not marry any of these women and maintain their position if they didn't have permission right so, well and just a little bit of a common sense i mean mm -hmm. you're gonna have to at least get formal or not even at the right. time, you're going to have to get the blessing Correct. of the queen if you want this to be and, a happy, healthy situation. And I would also point out for a family who's so racist and against poor Megan, um, that was an awfully nice wedding. I guess she's upset because it was at Windsor and St. George's Chapel. Um, I guess she's upset because uh, it wasn't at Westminster Abbey. And the and the taxpayers paid for that wedding. Exactly. And everything associated with that wedding. They spent a lot of money. And then the taxpayers spent a lot of money to renovate uh one of the one of the houses on the Windsor grounds to Harry and Meghan's specifications. And they never lived there. Yeah, it sounds like she's just been an insufferable brat her entire life, and, and will then, probably yeah. die that way. And then when they when they wanted to leave, the they were like, "Well, you're gonna have to pay all this money back." And so I think that that started off the um, 
because when when you leave and you don't have all the benefits uh and and the duke of windsor was the same way he constantly complained that he wasn't getting enough money and he wasn't accorded the you know the uh respect he was due and they would not allow the duchess of windsor to be referred to as her royal highness although in the house in his household they did refer to her that way but officially she was not an hrh which is well, a title yeah. that that is you know they're very fond of well, diana lost hrh all, too yeah. well you see in all of these situations where the people want the benefits but none of the responsibility so they give up the responsibility and then they cry because they lose some of the benefits correct all right, so that's enough of that tangent. So in 2000, at the urging of David Protest, um, and this kind of backfired. I think Protest was trying to get the state to engage in mutual testing. And then Protest could pick what to test and could use any inconclusive DNA results from that testing to muddy the waters as to, as to Skinner's guilt. But what the DA did was like, screw you. He sent everything off. He chose the lab. And he did it without the without Skinner being involved. So he tested additional items. And the results were Twyla was included as a contributor of blood on the cover of a blue notebook, a hair found on her back, a hair found on her left hand, and a hair from the axe handle. Skinner was included as a contributor to DNA found on a cigarette butt. And Twyla and Skinner were both included as contributors to a mixed profile from hair in Twyla's right hand. Uh, a piece of bloodstained gauze reflected the profile of an unknown male individual, but they did not have reference samples from Randy and Elwin for gene screen to do this testing. Uh, because the only reference samples they had were Twyla and Skinner. And a cassette tape with blood on it reflected a profile that was a mixture of two unknown individuals. No conclusion could be drawn about certain other items. So this was 2000. It was, it was somewhat inconclusive, although the mixed profile in Twyla's right hand is Skinner and Twyla. I would say that that is pretty definitive. Right. Well, that's, I think, the thing that's lost in this is it's not like he claims he has an alibi and they didn't find any evidence against him, but he still got convicted. I mean, there's mm -hmm. a ton of evidence against him. And he's just like, well, if you don't test every single piece of fiber in the entire house, then it's unfair. Yeah, correct. That is, and that is a good way of summing up exactly what the claims are. Yeah, right. So in 2001, Skinner filed a motion for DNA testing. And another, another thing that's happening in, these case, in this case, Skinner is filing a lot of things pro se. Yep. And Which means I, yourself, right? Correct. Not without and an attorney, as the great paralegal that he is. He's just filling, he's clogging the courts, basically. Correct. And one of the problems that, and he, and he apparently is doing it with the, approval of his attorneys who um haven't objected now it may be that he's he's got protests may have been bankrolling funding for an attorney for him right and i believe he does have a french wife who's collecting money for attorneys so he's not he's not an indigent he's not benefiting from indigent rep representation or representation at the expense of taxpayers in Texas. Um, although the attorneys representing him may get some taxpayer dollars in federal court. I'm not sure. Right. Um, well, and I mean, I hate to inject just common sense. I mean, these were, these people seem to have a somewhat chaotic, and likely violent lifestyle. Mm -hmm. The fact that 
a drop of blood might be found somewhere in the house doesn't seem unrelated to the crime. You know, there was a fight six months ago. Doesn't right. seem to be completely, again, outside of, of the realms of possibility. I mean, especially on a cassette, right? I mean, cassettes are usually held in pretty tight spaces, those little bitty slots. It wasn't like, you know, it's not super easy for blood to get in there unless, you know, somebody, you know. Right, right. Got blood on it and then put it up, you know put it in mm -hmm. the case correct um so then um his his first motion for dna testing was denied on july 2nd 2002 he appealed that to the texas court of criminal appeals on august 1st 2002 on december 18th the court of criminal appeals sent the case back to the trial court to get an uh, an order from the trial court that basically followed the article 64.03 uh, which required certain questions be answered to uh, for them to evaluate whether testing was properly denied uh, by the trial court um, it's a 64.03 determination and that the supplemental record had to be filed within 30 days the supplemental record was filed on January 22nd, 2003, and that included the judge's findings of fact and conclusions of law related to the request for DNA testing. Um, on September 10th, 2003, the Court of Criminal Appeals issued an opinion uh, affirming the denial of DNA testing. Skinner filed a motion for rehearing on September 25th, 2003. I don't know what the grounds for that were. Um, I've never been able to find that actual motion. Uh, but on December 10th, 2007, the rehearing was denied and the Court of Criminal Appeals issued what was a replacement opinion withdrawing their September opinion. And basically they found that um, the trial court, let me see. Um, they basically found assuming arguendo that each piece of evidence was provide negative results for the defendant. He still did not meet the standard of proof because DNA evidence from the previous test was inculpatory. The analysis demonstrated the intermingling of victims and defendants DNA probably during the time when she, Twyla, was struggling for her life. Because defendants DNA was found mixed with the victim's DNA in her right hand during the autopsy, there was nothing about the other items found at the crime scene that, if linked to a third person, would cast doubt on defendants' presence at the scene or his involvement in the offense. Given that evidence, the presence of a third party's DNA at the crime scene would not constitute affirmative evidence of innocence. And that is even, like they said, third party DNA on the knife would not exonerate Skinner because he's got the victim's blood on his clothing and right. he's got a mixture of his blood and, and Twyla's or his DNA and Twyla's mm -hmm in Twyla's right hand. Right. Because when he said, I mean, he says they won't test the DNA. Mm -hmm. That's not really true. They've tested the DNA. They just, he wants them to trust. He test wants to test DNA. everything. Yeah, and literally, he wants yeah. to use that testing and the results of that testing, anything that doesn't point to him, right? anything that's unknown. Because one of the things that I'm going to point out to everyone, they may not know this or understand this, Without a reference sample from Robert Donnell, they're never going to be able to determine whether unknown DNA belongs to him or not. They might be able to try familial DNA, like get DNA from his surviving brother and look at YSTR. But even that isn't necessarily going to answer the question is certainly not going to definitively prove that Robert Donnell is guilty based on nuclear DNA. 
because they don't have a reference sample. And they don't have a reference sample to even develop mitochondrial DNA for him. Right. It's just presumed because he's a maternal <coughs> relation. I mean, it would be hilarious to find out all these years later that Bobby was taken in from another family by the Donnell family and wasn't even bi biologically related to any of them. That's just speculation, but it's, it's a situation that isn't necessarily even unlikely because uh, he was born in 1930 and during the depression. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, my great grandparents took in a child. Yeah, it wouldn't from a be, relative for several years. Insane. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, they actually took the child in, I think, during the 20s with their, you know, with their daughters. Um, but yeah, I mean, during the 1930s, anything could have happened. Um, not saying that's what it was, but so we're never going to know definitively. We're never going to have nuclear DNA that proves Robert Donald's guilt. It's an impossibility because there's no reference sample from Robert Donald to which unknown DNA can be compared. Well, and just to, I mean, restate the obviously, there's zero evidence pointing to him. It's mm -hmm. just speculation because there could be some hair somewhere that wasn't fully tested. There's no evidence pointing to him. And is it, has he ever been under suspicion other than just wild claims? Um, he was the prime, he was the suspect, uh, the alternate suspect at Skinner's trial. So the jury rejected what Skinner presented which Got was it. following Twyla around. Right. So he's the only, Skinner's the only one who's really Correct. said he did. And There's no, he was never really, I, you know, seriously investigated. Again, I've never seen Skinner claim to have seen Robert Donald in the house. Well, yeah, but ironically, didn't he claim to see other people? There was the ex-husband and then the other mystery man. So he mentioned yeah, but he, other he, they were gone, but they were gone before the murders happened because he beat him up and ran him out. Got, but they were in, okay. Gotcha. Right. So he doesn't claim I woke up. Donald was standing over Twyla with the axe handle, or or Donald was running out of the house with a bloody knife. And another nuance that I picked up during my review of of some of these uh, DNA related briefs and opinions is, it appears that when Elwin went out the front door of the house. He was being pursued by Skinner, who dropped the knife on the front porch. As Elwin went out the door, went out the screen door and down the street. And that's probably when Skinner went out the back door. So um, that is chilling but again skinner's never said i woke up and saw donald you know chasing elwin out of the house with a knife in his hand um not only did he not say that ever in 1993 or 1994 or 1995 but he's never said it to this day even though that's who his his attorneys are claiming is the real killer so uh July 30th, 2007, a second motion for DNA testing was filed by Skinner. Uh, that was denied on December 6, 2007. And the reason for the denial uh, of the trial court at that time was because his attorneys did not seek DNA testing at trial. The way the, the statute was crafted um, an amendment to the statute said if you had access to DNA evidence at trial and you didn't use it, then you couldn't now seek post-conviction DNA testing. And that was an effort to try and prevent people who were convicted with some DNA evidence from seeking testing when they didn't do so at trial. Um, the court of criminal the texas court of criminal appeals issued a an opinion on 
September 23rd, 2009, basically affirming the denial of DNA testing uh, by the trial court. And um, let's see, I'm trying to uh, look at where I want to start. Okay, it was not under, it was not enough under Texas Code of Criminal Procedure 64, no fault of the convicted person provision to claim that an exculpatory test result would change the outcome of the case. The fact that testing would be outcome determinative if conducted did not mean the testing was in some sense unavailable. There was no showing of ineffective assistance of counsel made because a failure to seek DNA testing was a matter of sound trial strategy. You don't, when you have DNA that implicates your client, you don't go testing more DNA to find more DNA to implicate your client. That would be the ineffective assistance. Um, trial counsel explained he did not ask for testing because he was afraid the DNA would turn out to be the defendant's. Um, so, uh, and again, the court reiterated that a substantial amount of incriminating physical evidence connected Skinner to the crime. Thus, his proffered evidence on the issue of incapacity did not call into question defense counsel's strategy to forego DNA testing. And this is an instance similar to Reed where they're trying to use information they've developed and arguments that they've crafted now to try to justify getting dna testing because now they've got people saying skinner absolutely could not have committed the murders because he was allergic to codeine and he was so whacked out of his head that he could not have even walked yeah and again but all again, that would have been known yeah back and in and just as at trial years. that is contradicted by the fact that he walked out of the house through the back door yeah, and went to, to andrea reeds yeah exactly so uh, September 2nd, 2011, Skinner filed a new motion for a third motion for DNA testing. Um, this was done after the 1983 Skinner versus Switzer claim was uh, he was successful with the U.S. Supreme Court. He also filed a motion to order the state to comply with Chapter 64.02, which I believe was to try and force them to give him access to the evidence. Um, on in Skinner versus Switzer on October 27, 2011, the U.S. District Court magistrate recommended that Skinner's proceedings be stayed and abated pending resolution of his third DNA motion in state court. And Skinner was ordered to file a motion to lift the stay within 10 days of any action by the CC, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. The third motion for DNA testing was denied on November 2nd, 2011. The district court uh, adopted the report and recommendation. So the basically Skinner versus Switzer as of November 4th, 2011 had been stayed. And the case was administratively closed at that time. Um, the Court of Criminal Appeals on November 7th ordered the district court to enter an order containing relevant 64.03 determinations within 15 days of their order and um, requested a supplemental clerk's record from the uh, district court. Skinner filed a notice of appeal on the 7th and um, he had an execution date pending in November of 2011, which I haven't gotten to the execution dates. But that was stayed because he was pursuing DNA testing. Uh, the supplemental record was filed on November 15th. And a second supplemental record was lodged on November 18th. And then the judge's amending order was filed on November 21st, basically finding that Skinner had not established that he would not have been convicted with exculpatory DNA results. And Skinner's request was not made to unreasonably delay the execution of his sentence. Um, and then the case was submitted to the Court of Criminal Appeals to uh, on May 12th, 2012. So Skinner has had several execution dates, and I'm just going to kind of run over them. Uh, he was set for a date on March 7th, 1999. There may have been a pro forma date in 1995 as well, 
but I didn't find the exact date, so I left it off. He was also set uh, for a date on October 20th, 2009. The date would have been February 24th, 2010. Um, there was an issue with the death warrant issued by the court on November 13th, 2009. So uh, a motion for stay of execution uh, or rather a motion to vacate and withdraw that date were granted and the date was changed to March 24, 2010. And that date was ultimately stayed by the U.S. Supreme Court due to Skinner versus Switzer. Um, Skinner filed multiple state subsequent state claims, uh, some in 2010 while pursuing Skinner versus Switzer. Uh, he had a writ of mandamus and a writ of prohibition seeking to block the execution on February 24th. Uh, those were ultimately, he wasn't granted um, leave to file those. He also filed a subsequent state claim alleging actual innocence, and that was denied um, or dismissed as successive. And his stay of execution and time for investigation of claims were also denied and um, he had a motion in federal court to stay his execution which was denied for lack of jurisdiction um, and the he got another date in July of 2011 for November of 2011 and uh, he filed a motion to modify or withdraw and at the same time filed the third motion for DNA testing. Uh, he filed a motion for stay of execution at the Court of Criminal Appeals, and that was ultimately granted, although I don't have it on the outline. And then, lo and behold, they agreed to, uh, they, the parties got together and agreed to DNA testing. And so on June 12th, they filed a joint motion to vacate and remand for submission of an agreed proposed order for forensic DNA testing at the Court of Criminal Appeals. That was granted and the appeal was dismissed. A, an agreed order for DNA testing was entered at the district court on July, uh, June 22nd, 2012. And then a motion to dismiss was filed in federal court on July 20th, 2012, dismissing Skinner versus Switzer. And that was granted and dismissed on October, on July 31st. So DNA testing begins in June and November, uh, on November 14th, 2012, the state filed an advisory regarding DNA testing. And the results were, first of all, Twyla was not sexually assaulted. The only DNA found in her sexual assault kit was her own. There was no foreign DNA under her fingernails. Of 18 hairs from her hands, eight matched her DNA. And there was no DNA recovered from 10 hairs. And I believe this may have been hairs with roots that were capable of nuclear DNA testing. So the 10 hairs weren't capable of nuclear DNA. And they were probably what was later subjected to mitochondrial DNA testing. Spoiler alert, Skinner's DNA was found in locations in Randy and Elwin's room on two stains from a cassette tape, two stains on a tennis shoe, one stain on the comforter bedspread, I believe on Elwin's bed, one stain from the dresser, one stain from a cassette holder, and one strain, stain from a handprint on the door frame. So now the blood stains the blood stain, the blood where the prints were found has now been DNA tested where it hadn't been before. And the blood, the blood stained prints were in Skinner's DNA. They also oh, it just found keeps getting worse with every new revelation. <laughs> they also found DNA mixtures on the knife from the front porch, which included Skinner, Randy, and Elwin. They found there was a there was a plastic, a black plastic bag in the 
living room and it was found with a dish towel in it and a knife in it, that second knife had no DNA findings. Um, so it probably was unconnected to the murder and the one on the porch was the murder weapon. On November 27, 2012, there was an agreement of the parties for further DNA testing entered. And it included further testing on carpet sample extracts from earlier testing from Randy and Elwin's room, uh, further testing on the knife from the porch, further testing from the other knife, which were taken by DBS, DPS. Results not matching reference samples will be sent to CODIS and testing was to be performed by the Lubbock DPS. The state on April 2nd, 2013, filed a second advisory. DNA, uh, Skinner's DNA was found on all six samples from the knife that were taken in the porch knife taken in 1994. And two samples that were taken in 2012, there were no unknown DNA profiles found on the knife. And there was an unidentified profile on the carpet with no match in CODIS and a YTSTR mixture that did not exclude Skinner. There was an agreement for mitochondrial DNA testing on the carpet samples and on some of the hairs from Twyla's uh, right hand, three hairs, and then a hair from her left hand and her ring finger. Uh, they also amended the order to, on April 23rd, to allow Bode technology or Bode technology group to perform that mitochondrial DNA testing. On August 30th, 2013, Skinner's attorneys filed a third advisory regarding DNA testing. And this has got to be the most ridiculous circular argument of pure speculation nothing but pure speculation um, I've ever read in any case in my life. And this pretty much sums up how Skinner's attorneys view these DNA results. Um, first of all, they do concede that and mitochondrial DNA testing found one of the hairs in Twyla's hand belonged, you know, did not exclude Skinner because that's all mitochondrial DNA can say is it doesn't exclude Skinner. However, they argue that the mitochondrial DNA from three of the hairs in Twyla's hand don't exclude Donald, and therefore they implicate Donald. They basically claim Skinner's DNA is on the knife because he handled it all the time and that it was in other locations in Randy's and Elwin's room because of contact unrelated to the murders, contamination and or transfer. They also argue that had Skinner killed the victims as the state claimed, the DNA should have been mixed with Randy's on his blanket and that the DNA on the door handles should have been a mixture of Skinner or one or more of the victims. Finally, they allege that because the mitochondrial DNA on the hairs do not exclude Donald, Skinner's defense has evidentiary support. Um, it's the longest winded bunch of bullshit I've ever, it even gives Glossop's attorneys and Don Knight a run for their fucking money. So said another way, there was originally initial DNA testing. It mm -hmm. just pointed to Skinner. There was later DNA testing. It just pointed to Skinner. And now they're saying, well, there actually wasn't enough, D you know, the DNA testing yeah. was bad for these reasons. Those, yeah, they, he's just clogging the court. At this those point. 19th, 19 instances of Skinner's DNA are all the result of innocent contact, contamination or transfer, and are not related to the murders, including the eight instances of Skinner's DNA on the knife that was the murder weapon, including mixtures of Skinner's DNA with Randy and Elwin. Yes. They're arguing that's meaningless. And that with, even with that, these inconclusive results 
and speculative arguments would convince one reasonable juror not to not to convict and i think that's another problem is that the the standard they're using is we've got all this information we're throwing it all at the wall some of it's bound to stick and a juror would not convict him when in reality you have to show a little bit more than that right you know um so they have uh an agreed evidentiary hearing order because it's not going to end there there's going to be an evidentiary hearing which was scheduled over two days um february 3rd and 4th of 2014 the court sets of deadlines for identifying witnesses and or designated witnesses and exchanging exhibits they also included some stipulations there was a jacket that appeared in pictures from the crime scene. Um, it was it had some blood spatter on the sleeves, which I think has been misrepresented and mischaracterized by Skinner. Um, also, he has tested. He had stated in interviews that the jacket was a men's forty-four large. He says that wasn't my jacket. I couldn't have worn that jacket because it would have swallowed me up. Well, guess what? It would have swallowed Bobby Donnell up too because Bobby D Robert Donnell was as much an Oompa Loompa as Henry Skinner. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, of Bobby course. Donnell was probably smaller than Skinner because according to the Oklahoma DOC, Bobby Donnell was only five feet tall. Skinner's supposedly 5'9". Although I know a lot of short men are five nine. <laughs> um, I had a boss who, according to his driver's license, was five nine. I'm only five two, and when I wore three inch heels, I was looking down at the top of his head. <laughs> so I don't think he was five nine. Um, but uh, for whatever that's worth, so Bobby Donald couldn't have worn it either. And he, they have a witness who said, oh, yeah, he had a jacket exactly like that, but not a men's 44 large. Now, the person, that jacket would have fit Randy and it would have fit Elwin. It might have been a little big on Elwin because Elwin was very thin, but it would have fit Randy perfectly. So more likely than not, the jacket, which just happened to be there and got blood spatter on it while Skinner was beating um, Twyla to death was you know just there and exactly. it belonged to randy or well, yeah, it, it might was, have belonged to elwin right it was new year's eve it was chilly it's you know mm -hmm. it's it gets really cold in the panhandle at this time of year so it wouldn't be shocking there was a jacket out yeah so um but anyway yeah he argues and they wanted to do you know what they wanted to do was test the collar and test the armpits and see if they could develop a DNA profile from that. I mean, he's, I mean, at this point, I mean, it's a little bit frustrating. I mean, at this point, he's basically wanting to just reinvestigate. I mean, this has gone, at least as a lay person, it feels like this has gone well beyond mm -hmm. any kind of appeal. I mean, he's literally wanting a brand new investigation to start from day one and just reinvestigate the case through the appeal Correct. process. Correct. Um, and, and I think the biggest problem with this, again, is he lacks reference sample from Donald. And that's probably what he's going for, right? Because he probably, maybe he's clever enough to know that, but it's enough to cast doubt, especially if Correct. you have a mystery suspect where you can't ever prove Correct. it was him or not him. That's going right. to be enough to get a lot of money from French folks. So, yeah. Uh, and, and people who oppose the death penalty no matter what. Um, there was an agreed order entered in January of 2014 authorizing the release of DNA data for lab personnel due to inadvertent contamination of some evidence during 2012 testing at DPS. And that was um, two lab personnel who uh, took part in testing in 2012. Uh, their DNA was found in a couple of unknown samples that were developed during the course of testing. Um, they were using a mini filer 
which is an amplification program or an amplification kit. I don't know how to refer to it because I'm not really scientifically oriented. Um, but anyway, it's extremely sensitive. Mm. And so that's why in later years, DNA labs started wearing masks and face goggles and gloves and Teflon suits to collect and um, right. test DNA because it's so sensitive. Basically, what they believe happened is, for example, one of the contaminations, the guy was present in the lab talking to the analyst, and somehow his DNA ended up on the sample that the analyst was working with at the moment. All right. Well, yeah. And as, I mean, it's getting so it's just like, every, I mean, you think about anybody that's ever come into the house or investigated the crime scene, the police, mm -hmm. paramedic, I mean, Right. It's you're getting crazy. You know, I mean, you hear a few of these crazy stories where DNA shows up when you have no idea how you would expect it, but it's from a, you know, a fast food worker touched the mm -hmm. bag that ended up in the house that then got on the, you know, the victim's clothes. I mean, it's gotten so crazy. Correct. So um, they also entered at that time a stipulated order in, in April, actually, they entered a stipulated order setting a date for filing a proposed findings of May 30th, 2014. And basically, I think the court had set an earlier date and neither party was ready to file their findings. So they probably were waiting on transcripts. So they set a date of May 30th, 2014. The proposed findings actually weren't filed until June 6, 2014. Um, although I didn't find an order granting any additional time. Um, but there may have been some intervening circumstance or an intervening request for additional time, like another week. And that's, it's not unusual. And both parties were benefit to it. It's not like Skinner filed his on the 30th and then the, the state filed theirs on the 6th. Um, Basically, Skinner's, you know, again, arguing that the results are exculpatory because of what wasn't found and that the mtDNA findings implicate Donald. And that's basically the same song and dance. Uh, the state filed its proposed findings and pointed out the 19 instances of Skinner's DNA profile on the various blood stains and, and including the knife from the porch where his DNA was found at six locations are and found on the handle and the base of the knife, which were swabs done in 2012. Um, the mixture of stain, five stains that had a mixture of Randy and Skinner's DNA profiles, and then six swabs from the knife that had a mixture of Randy and Elwin, uh, I mean, Elwin and Skinner's DNA profile. They also found that there was a, they also argued that there was a hair from Twyla's hand that didn't exclude Skinner. They argued that these results don't help Skinner. They also argued, because one of the arguments being made by Skinner is that at some point during an examination, the hairs were characterized as being visually dissimilar to victim hair. And they pointed out that that statement about the hairs found in these reports were not the result of a microscopic comparison of those hairs to reference samples from the victims and the people in the in the Busby household. They were basically just like a cataloging. This is what the hair looks like. This is what color it appears to be. And it doesn't appear to be similar to the victim's hair because the victim's hair was brown and this hair is blondish reddish. And that was actually across all the hairs that were, were cataloged. Um, and so the, the one that doesn't exclude Skinner isn't, is visually dissimilar to him as well. But hair has different colors and different, different uh, appearances. So that's why with, 
when you do a microscopic hair comparison, you have multiple samples pulled from multiple places um, that are examined individually against hairs to see if it if it's you know consistent with any of the hairs from the victim's heads. And these again were like probably you know one or two hairs. It, it's not an actual accurate base of comparison. To say it couldn't belong to the victims. I know I just went in circles and that doesn't make a bit of sense, does it? I think I'm following you, but it is, it's a little bit tough to follow. Yeah. Um, and it's equally tough to, to follow. Yeah, it's. That they're saying, even though, I mean, it would probably have been visually dissimilar to Donald's hair. And Donald's hair wasn't among the hairs that the the visual similarity dissimilar dissimilarity were being done. Again, they were talking about it didn't appear to be from Twilight, it didn't appear to be from Elwyn, it didn't appear to be from Randy because it was a different color than what their known hair was. But I mean, the problem is too. I mean, the thing about it is. With all of these types of hairs, I mean, everyone has to keep in mind, this isn't, I mean, this is their home, where yeah. I would assume people come over. These people seem to like to drink quite a bit. Drinking is a generally a social event. People come over, mm -hmm. they watch football, watch the Cowboys, they drink. Like, it's I mean, finding random hairs in a home is not unusual. Where hair mm -hmm. matters is if you're at a place where, oh, I would have expected to find this hair at this part along with these other hairs. That's unusual. Right, right. Finding hairs at and, a home is, I mean, if you looked at my house, you'd probably find 300 people's hairs. Yeah. You know, I mean, no matter how much you sweep, you and might find I, something strange. It's I not unusual. Part of the argument, I mean, certainly their argument for the 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 defense's argument that the the hair in Twyla's hand that doesn't exclude Skinner is irrelevant or or not inculpatory is because the carpet was observed to be pretty dirty. And so you're gonna have a lot of hairs that are gonna be picked up that have nothing to do with the crime. But the state also pointed out that the mitochondrial DNA may not exclude Donald, but it also doesn't exclude Twyla, Elwin, Randy, Lisa, Beverly, LaDonna, who was Twyla's sister, Bobby and Douglas, who were Twyla's brothers, and her uncle Lewis. And finally, they also argued that some of the extraneous alleles found in some profiles would have might have been from the result of sensitivity of mini filer. So the state put a pretty good, yeah, made a pretty good argument. Um, and basically, it comes down to that Skinner has not shown that these DNA results, had they been available at his trial, would have resulted in his acquittal. And that's the burden that's on him. And and interestingly enough. One of the things that Skinner also argued in some of his briefs at different times is that the state didn't bring forth any additional evidence proving Skinner's guilt. And it's like, excuse me, <laughs> that's not their burden. That The burden's not on them. They've proven his guilt. And certainly the DNA testing to date, including this new testing, is all inculpatory as to Skinner. Absolutely, yeah. That's... Based on just the sheer volume yeah, of finding a... DNA profiles. If nothing else, finding Skinner's DNA profile mixed at least with Elwin's DNA on that night is game over. Yeah. Every time they get new stuff, it just points, looks worse mm -hmm. for him. Yeah. And just because there might be, I mean, it's unre It's just, I mean, let's just be honest. It is unreasonable to ask, especially with so much evidence already pointing to him, it is unreasonable to ask the state to test every single hair or fiber mm -hmm. in the entire home. It's just irrational. Mm -hmm. So uh, the judge on July 14, 2014, adopted the state's proposed findings 
basically ruling that Skinner had not met his burden uh, to show that he would not have been convicted had these DNA results been available. Um, and I think another thing that's that uh, a lot of these defense attorneys do is they want to look at it in isolation and they want to ignore the evidence of guilt at the trial because they claim that what they've developed over the years refutes that and that's not necessarily true. And so uh, his attorney, Douglas Robinson, did put out a statement that basically argued Skinner's DNA was found as a result of innocent contact, the mitochondrial DNA implicates Donald, and that uh, they linked the lost jacket to Donald at the hearings, and the judge just ignored all that and was applying the law wrong. Skinner filed a notice of appeal on August 11, 2014. The record was lodged on September 12, 2014. Uh, Skinner filed an op opening brief in November of 2014. The state filed its brief on January 26, 2015. Uh, the appellate court issued an order on March 18, 2015, Wanting the parties to address at oral argument whether the case was a result, the appeal arose from a properly filed chapter chapter 64 motion. Um, and then the state also, the TCCA also sought on March 20th, 2015, to inspect uh, states exhibit 31 and defendants exhibits 30, 32, 31, and 38 from the hearing. Uh, in their review of the case, there was, uh, on June 30th, 2015, the DPS sent letters out to various defendants, counsel, and courts regarding potential errors in DNA results reported uh, by the DPS due to errors identified in the statistical databases relied on by DPS uh, and by the manner in which DPS analyzed, analyzed DNA mixtures. On February 19, 2016, Skinner's attorneys filed an advisory with the Court of Criminal Appeals because Skinner was now seeking the DPS uh, to do perform reanalysis of the DNA in his case from 2012. On March 9, 2016, the Court of Criminal Appeals issued an opinion that found that jurisdiction had been established. They abated the appeal and uh, remanded the case for further proceedings at the trial court due to the need to recalculate DNA mixture results. And they ordered that the issues be resolved by the trial court within 90 days from the date of that order. The parties filed a joint motion to extend time in May, seeking a 180 day extension for DPS to complete the necessary training and implementation of software that was needed to conduct the recalculations of mixtures in Skinner's case. On June 8, 2016, the, the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals issued an order instructing the trial court to determine whether the bulk of the recalculations had been completed by previously imposed deadline, as the parties had stated in their motion had been done or would be done to determine what other laboratories and DPS laboratories in Texas or laboratories under contract with DPS could process the results that utilize many filer. Because apparently there was a, a an STR mix program, but it could not analyze many filer testing results. So they were getting software and getting training and um, I guess, certification on so that software to perform the re reanalysis. And they also wanted the trial court to determine uh, if other laboratories could process the test results at issue within a reasonable time, and if not, uh, why they could not timely process results. Uh, the tri trial court was also instructed to resolve the issues within 30 days of the date of that order 
and the court said no further extensions of time would be entertained. The record goes silent from that point. <laughs> so I'm guessing that there was a supplemental record filed and I'm guessing that basically the DPS was doing what it could, the best it could, and the Court of Criminal Appeals just had to accept that. Because the next thing is on June 15th, 2017, a year later, uh, the parties filed a joint advisory that DPS had issued its report on May 19th, 2017, completing the reanalysis of outstanding samples and requesting 180 days to December 12, 2017 to set a hearing date in the trial court. A status report was filed on October 25th, 2017 at TCCA, but I don't have that report, so I don't know exactly what that status was. Um, there was a hearing held on January 9th, 2018 at the district court, 31st district court in Gray County. A joint advisory was filed on January 23rd, 2018. Um, the parties basically, the parties were going to file proposed findings 30 days after receipt of the transcript from the hearing. On April 2nd, 2018, the state filed its notice of amended findings of fact and conclusions of law. Uh, basically, their argument was that Skinner had not shown a reasonable probability that he would not have been convicted had the DNA testing results been available at the time of his 1995 capital murder trial. On the same date, Skinner's attorneys filed their proposed findings, and basically they argued the DNA results were exculpatory, that there was unknown DNA and empty DNA that pointed to Donald, although that's not true because they don't have D Donald's DNA to compare to the unknown DNA. That uh, the instances of Skinner's DNA profile being found were all results of innocent contact unrelated to the murders. For example, they argued that, well, he used to make sandwiches that, with that knife all the time. So that's where his DNA came from. And they argued that a reasonable juror would not convict with the DNA results now available. And this is another thing. They argue that the DNA results plus the other evidence they've developed creates reasonable doubt or would create reasonable doubt in the mind of at least one juror. And therefore, he's entitled to a new trial. Um, the court adopted the state's amended findings of fact and conclusions of law on May 8, 2018. Um, Somehow, <laughs> the the district court must have been primed and ready because they were able to lodge the record at the Court of Criminal Appeals on May 9th, 2018. Uh, the parties filed a joint motion to file supplemental briefs on May 10th uh, to assist the court, and that motion was granted. Um, basically, Skinner would be uh, given until June, June 20th, 2018, and the state would be given until June 20th, 2018 to file supplemental briefs. Another supplemental record was lodged on May 11th, 2018, uh, and Skinner filed his supplemental brief and basically argued that while the 2016-2017 reanalysis had no material impact on the original results, Skinner was entitled to a favorable finding based on the 2012 and 2013 testing results, uh, including the mitochondrial DNA from hairs that inculpates Donald, but it doesn't, it just doesn't exclude him, among many others, that finding the lack of victim DNA on the back door was exculpatory they argued the foreign DNA on the dish towel and in the boys' bedroom was exculpatory and that any inconclusive results were exculpatory. Uh, and this is where I'm talking bullshit. Uh, the state filed its supplemental uh, brief on July 20th 
And basically, they just argue that Skinner's claims about exculpatory results are delusional. Um, the neither the original nor the reanalyzed chapter 64 results make it reasonable, re reasonably probable that Skinner would not have been convicted had those results been available at trial. And they argue visually dissimilar hairs do not demonstrate a reasonable probability that Skinner would not have been convicted. Lack of victim DNA on the back door is not exculpatory. Foreign DNA on the dish towel does not prove Skinner would not have been convicted. Foreign DNA in the boy's bedroom is not exculpatory. Uh, because it was from a carpet that that could have been the person who installed the carpet's DNA. It could have been the landlord's DNA if he, you know, did anything with the carpet around the time of the murders. Uh, absence of Skinner's DNA on the blanket covering Randy would not alter the outcome of the trial. And the scarcity of Skinner's DNA in other areas does not prove non-conviction. As that's basically what Skinner's arguing. It's like if he really killed them, their DNA would be mixed on the other on the blood stains on the doorknobs. Well, that's not necessarily true. That's speculative, uh, because Skinner could have wiped his hands, but he was bleeding, exactly. and so by the time he touched the doorknob, he had actively bled, and that left his blood on the doorknob. Exactly. Um, so basically, it's if they find his blood. It's because he was he didn't do it, and if they don't find his blood, it was because he didn't do it. It's, Correct. He just, or they don't find the victim's blood. Yeah, they don't find the with his blood, blood in that location. He didn't do it. Right. Yeah. Skinner sought leave to file a reply brief to argue the weight that should be given to inconclusive results that occur with the use by DNA labs of STR mix, and that request was granted. The reply brief was filed again. I didn't find the reply brief. Um, so I don't know what their exact um, twisting argument was. The case was submitted on March 27, 2019. Skinner was permitted to file another supplemental brief with a court decision from federal court that had no authority in the Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, but it addressed the admissibility of DNA results produced with STR mix, which is trademarked, by the way. Um, and then another post, uh, oh, no, sorry. Um, so that post submission brief was filed on November 5th, 2019. And then nearly three whole years passed while the Court of Criminal Appeals considered Skinner's appeal of the denial of relief as a result of DNA test results developed between 2012 and 2013, and the reanalysis of those results that occurred between 2016 and 2017. So if Skinner's attorneys ever use the terms rush to judgment, in connection with this case, I will personally track them down and smack the living <laughs> crap out of them. Well, I mean, because... I, I mean, not only that, but I mean, I feel like of all the cases that we've done and other cases that I've just sort of heard, of, you know, read about, this guy seems to be getting the most, the longest rope given the lack of any alternate, like all the evidence mm -hmm. pointing to him. And the lack, zero evidence pointed to somebody else. My gosh, the state of Texas is jumping through hoops for this guy. It's ridiculous at this point. Yes. Um, and, you know, the, the federal court, Skinner got a hearing and Skinner got discovery in federal court after EDPA. Um, because the state court wouldn't consider his post-conviction writs. And then on this DNA, again, yeah, he's gotten the most opportunity in spite of the inculpatory DNA results that were right. used at his trial. Well, I'm just, I think next he's just going to say it was Samuel Little or Henry Lee Lucas at this point, and then they're going to have to prove it wasn't them. Uh, I, he may try that, but at this stage, it's too late. 
that will not fly very far. Um, so the Court of Criminal Appeals on October 5th, 2022, finally issued its opinion on the DNA, the, the denial of, of relief or denial of a new trial based on DNA results. And they held that in a capital murder case, the appellate court found no evidence of the convicting court misapplying Texas Code of Criminal Procedure, Article 64.04. Um, they agreed with the convicted court's conclusion that the defendant failed to satisfy his burden because he failed to show that it was reasonably probable that he would not have been convicted had the DNA test results been available during his capital murder trial. Among other things, defendant's DNA profile appeared on all eight samples taken from the bloody knife, but no unidentified foreign profile was found on that item. And defendant could not be excluded as a possible donor of DNA in eight more locations that were established at trial. Yeah, so every new affirmed, test just points to him, makes mm -hmm. him look more and more guilty. Yeah. He's got, yeah. yeah, I think, like I said earlier, probably twice, I think at this point, he's just clogging the court to try to delay and delay, delay. Correct. On October 17th, 2022, uh, the court entered an order setting his execution for September 13th, 2023 at 6 o'clock p.m. Um, so do you have any insight? Why have... do they why do they set it? I mean, given that he's been on death row almost what is it I... almost 30 years? Why do they still set it for a almost a year away? Well, different states have different requirements, and I think. While they could have said it within 90 days, I think that with Skinner, they're hedging their bets. So they're giving him ample time to pursue whatever he's going to pursue. It was the alien. To avoid another stay being entered. Um, Skinner did file. Oh, sorry. No, I said that makes sense. They're just like, rather than have to do the stay, just let him enough time to get all the next round of insanity out. Correct. Um, so that he will have a solid date that will go. Um, they filed, uh, he did file a motion for rehearing on October 20th, 2022, arguing that due process limits the court's power to construe chapter 64, which doesn't make a freaking bit of sense because it's a state court interpreting a state law. you know, how is that violating due process? Um, the plain language of Article 6404 would permit a favorable finding based solely on the tendency of the DNA results in conjunction with other evidence in the case to raise a reasonable doubt about the defendant's guilt. Well, that's not the standard for 64.04. It's not that you could raise a reasonable doubt at a new trial. It's that you wouldn't be convicted. You have to show that you would not have been convicted. Uh, the opinion allows a trial court to substitute its own subjective determinations about the credibility of witnesses and the weight to be accorded their testimony for the perspective of a hypothetical reasonable juror. In upholding the Article 64.0 finding, the Court of Criminal Appeals stamped with approval the convicting court's failure to consider the collective impact of the DNA test results, and the court has construed Article 64.04 to foreclose a favorable finding for the defendant unless DNA test results clearly point to his innocence, an approach that violates due process because it is impossible to square with the language of the statute. So I think what they're doing is they're setting up a federal challenge. They're, they're setting up a 1983 claim now. Um, so future actions, because no action has been taken on the motion for rehearing. Potential future action is a successive writ based on actual innocence to federal court, which is actually unlikely to succeed. Um, he did file a successive writ with the Fifth Circuit alleging actual innocence, and he withdrew it. Um, back in 2011, I believe. Uh, so well, it's unlikely again, that think, that's going to be successful because if yeah. it was, he should have pursued it then. 
And this is a good time just to remind people that might get lost in the details to just go back to the basics of he fled the scene. He did not call the police. He stopped his ex from calling the police. He said he might have kicked her to death to his ex. And he just continued to change his story. So it's not like, you know, there's not yeah. a lot of reasons outside of the overwhelming DNA against him to believe that he is guilty. Right. And um, there, there likely will be a writ to the United States Supreme Court, um, which will be due 90 days after the Court of Criminal Appeals either denies rehearing or is, issues a new opinion unfavorable to Skinner. And then I think basically the primary thing which they've been doing for years is continuing to try the t- case in the court of public opinion, which if the confession or the st- inculpatory statements made to police by Skinner are brought up, everybody's lying but Skinner. Um, the loss of the jacket by the state will be probably a main factor that in other words, we had a witness who said this was Donald's jacket. It was worn by the assailant during the crime and the state lost it. So we can never prove it was Donald's jacket, which is one of those circular arguments. And again, at only five feet tall or five foot six, because I think there is a Texas record that puts him at five foot six. He could not have worn a man's 44 large jacket. Yeah, exactly. Any I mean, that's, that's probably a six, six foot. The six foot at least, which little, Randy, Randy would have probably been a men's large. Right. L one was tall but very thin, so he would have probably been a men's medium. Right. Um. So yeah, that jacket probably belonged to one of the boys and was just present when when Skinner murdered Twyla. Um. They also falsely claimed the DNA results in inculpating Skinner were insignificant. And the inconclusive partial profiles and empty DNA results were inculpatory as Donnell. What's their explanation for his fingerprints in the blood? Um, again, their argument is the if if he was the killer, the blood would have been a mixture of, of Skinner and Randy and Elwood. That's their argument. But why is his fingerprint there? They don't have an answer for that. No, they and they don't argue. They they're they're like. Yes, he left, but you know he was he was in a stupor. But and he they was got Andrew not in Reed enough to... of a stupor to go to his ex's house right. and tell her to not no, call no, the police. yeah. And and the stupor is very selective. It's a very they got selective her stupor. to recant. So they got her to recant and claim that when he arrived, he was in a stupor. How he managed to go four blocks, she don't know. She right. had to do everything. And how she had did to help he know if he house. was in a stupor? How did she know he was? She was calling the police. Yeah. Well, the other thing, the problem is, is they also made when she recanted, she claimed that she was threatened by the DA and police to to inculpate him in her statements, or she was going to go to death row too. So she was coerced to give negative statements about Skinner. Although that was rejected by the, by the courts. Again, it's, it's a court of public opinion. Right. And uh, they continue to rehash that. They also rehash his defenses presented at trial regarding his incapacity, his coding allergy and his inability to attract, strangle Twyla due to a pre-existing hand injury. And if you look at a lot of their briefs and their, statements in their um public uh their pleadings it all are they all always argue these things even though these things did not hold any weight with the jury and they were made to the jury exactly so um so that is pretty much it um where we stand with him again their their a writ won't be due until the rehearing is is either denied or the uh, Court of Criminal Appeals re issues an opinion unfavorable to Skinner. Um, he's set for execution on September 13th, day before my birthday, but um, that's there's a lot of time. Again, I'm, I think they set it that way so, because he has to continue pursuing now that he has a date. 
right. um, and hoping that he will pursue and it will be resolved before that yeah, date versus comes. having to keep moving the date. Exa yeah, exactly. Correct. Correct. So that is basically uh, we've wrapped up Hank Skinner. Um, again, as it did at trial, as it did in 2000, DNA evidence inculpates him and does not conclusively point to any alternate suspect. Yeah, that's what's so. I mean, I mean, I not to beat a dead horse, but I'm just of all the cases, this one is one that just feels like, I mean, there's zero evidence pointing to anybody else, and everything he does to try to appeal just makes it look worse and worse for him. I mean, I can understand the frustration with this guy. Yeah. So, um, we will. I will, of course, keep an eye on the case and. Um, if there are any significant developments, at least address them. If not, um, devote a whole episode. <laughs> so, but that's pretty much it. And this is the end of the year. Um, it is the end of season one because we're gonna we're gonna run our season January to December. I think it makes it easier to keep track of. Yeah. So absolutely. we've had twenty great episodes. Um, when did you join, Kyle? I think. Well, I you think know, I'm you having were a senior member, one. but I think I may have been around for one of the first ones. Yeah, I think you were. Yeah, I think it was. If maybe not the absolute first, but I think it might have been. And then I know I might have missed a couple there. Um, yeah, with some of the Oklahoma um, folks, but I think I've been here for probably All eighteen right. or nineteen of them. So you you got the job. I I've I have had um, and I I still say uh, I think I had a one of the Rodney Reed episodes. I did have a guest co-host yeah, for that. I think so. Right. And and she was great. And I'm having a senior moment. But um, that was one of the early ones. That was like maybe number one or two. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, if you're Kyle has, has apparently gotten the job by default. <laughs> I don't know if that makes me feel good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, you were, you were very good. And I'm not saying none of the, all of the guest co-hosts were good. Don't get me wrong. I think Kyle has gotten the job by default because he's been available and he's been on the zoom. We have week after week i don't know <laughs> i don't mean it i mean everybody all every all the guest co-hosts that i had were great i have to say and uh but if you if you were a guest co-host and you want to come back reach out to me on facebook and i certainly will um find a way to bring you back because you were all great um like I said, Kyle, maybe it's just that Kyle kept in touch with me. It's like, if you want the job, you have to, you have to keep in touch with the entity that you want to work for. So let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> I had a professor life, that once told me that uh, genius was 90% sweat. Yes. So, um, yes, I, I, uh, but I've enjoyed this, this year with you, Kyle. I really have. No, absolutely. And I, it's been a lot I, of fun. I think you're a natural. Um, you have great insight and great, uh, a great, you know, way of expressing yourself. Well, thank you. And I appreciate all the work you do. So for everybody that's listening, it does. I know you, you put in a tremendous amount of work. I mean, a lot of podcasts feels like, the host probably just listened to two or three other podcasts and read Wikipedia and just summarizes a case in a little bit different way. But you, I mean, you put in hours and hours of work. And so that's Thank something you. you can't get anywhere else. Thank you. Um, and I may, I may start giving you some homework next season. Although I did say you needed to watch some interviews with Skinner. 
Yeah, I did. I, I, I did. I took it up on the homework watch, with, well, uh, where, which I was like, aren't you a pathologist? Why are you doing YouTube videos? <laughs> and, um, and I did watch one. It's funny when you said that the uh, when you said he had a French wife, it clicked because one of the things that popped up outside of actually your episode was like the second on the YouTube results. But one of them was um, a French TV station. Yeah. Was it in French? Uh, well, the, the audio wasn't, but they had, I guess, French subtitles. Okay, because there was a Rodney Reed documentary done by French, and I could only ever find the French language version, which dubbed the Texas witnesses statements for that documentary into French. And I had a, a, a setting somewhere where the subtitles were cut off. So I couldn't, you know, I didn't have any English subtitles and I don't speak French. So there, and there's well, an English language version of it out there, but I just can't find it. So. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, it's always great. I mean, I love them. I'm a Francophile, but the folks that gave us the guillotine and the reign of terror love to uh, <laughs> come to America and get outraged over capital punishment. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know that is kind of funny. Um that uh that the french history was so bloody in the 1700s and yet now they want to sit in judgment Basically. for capital punishment so well i guess we'll we'll call it we'll wrap it now um well yeah well and again everybody uh have a uh, a happy new year and i hope uh 23 2023 is even better than um Yes. The rest of the 20s, which is definitely has a mixed record to date. So I'm hoping that we can turn this decade around before it's too late. Yeah, I I still would. I still am and am hesitant to go into 2023 20, without solid uh, review of the terms and conditions of saying. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Exactly. I want to <laughs> I want to review the terms and conditions before I agree. But as they say, I guess it's better than the alternative. Right. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's wrap it up. Thank you for listening to Based in Fact, a true crime podcast with Lisa O'Brien and Kyle Evans. If you like the show and want to know more, you can find us on Facebook or follow me on Twitter at O'Brien LN. Join us in two weeks for season two, episode one, updates. Kyle and I will provide updates for some of the cases we've covered in 2022. We'll talk about some of the cases in the media and perhaps discuss Harry and Meghan. Uh, and we'll look ahead to what's ahead in 2023. Until then, have a happy new year, a great two weeks, and stay safe.